We've been honored to narrate, for example, specifically uh, the um, earliest 40 hadith collection belongs to um, Muhammad ibn Aslam al-Tusi, rahimahullah, one of the um, um, second century imams of hadith, contemporary of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim and Imam Ahmad, rahimahumullah. Uh, his 40 hadith collections was compiled in his uh, hometown, which is the same hometown of Imam Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, Hujjat al-Islam. Um, another uh, renowned early hadith collection is the 40 hadith of Yaqub ibn Hassan uh, al-Nasawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, the um, uh, countryman of um, the famous Imam Abu Abdul Rahman, Ahmad ibn Shu'ayb al-Nasai. And um, this 40 hadith collection is uh, unique because its isnad contains two luminary women and the isnad has been preserved for every one of these collections, of course. Um, and um, uh, also um, Abu Abdul Rahman al-Sulami, one of the earliest codifiers in the spiritual discipline, uh, has four hadith uh, that actually began to introduce the concept of categorization or classifying the 40 hadith, whereby the, um, the hadiths of Tusi and uh, an Nasawi did not have a categorization. It didn't have a method. And this is something I'll come back to in a moment. They narrated collections that basically were arbitrary and relatively coherent in terms of um, their uh, direction, but not necessarily um, thought of as a methodology, not necessarily as um, a pedagogical direction, but more a collection of the most renowned hadith that people should know. Abu Abdul Rahman al sulami was among the first to um, actually begin to categorize the 40 hadith collections, and his was um, Adab al-Suhba, um, Abu Nu'aym, uh, inspired by Abu Nu'aym al-Asfahani, the compiler of the Hilya, who had the 40 hadith uh, codifying the spiritual discipline, which is also a very unique collection that survives. Um, uh, Nasr ibn Ibrahim al-Maqdisi from Jerusalem compiled a 40 hadith collection that's quite renowned among specialists. It exists uh, only in uh, manuscript form uh, in the Lahiriya. Um, as, um, as, as well as the, in the uh, royal collection in uh, Morocco. Um, there is also the, um, the notion of um, categorizing 40 collections from the larger compilations. For example, most renowned in that particular regard is um, 40 hadith from the Mu'jam of Tabarani, rahimahullah. Um, we've been honored to narrate it quite extensively. It's 10 volumes in Al-Mu'jam Al-Awsat and um, 20 in Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir. Uh, and the um, Imams after him culled 40 hadith collections from the larger compilation uh, and started another trend which is based on country. So, um, and hence the notion of Al-Buldaniya or the 40 hadith that are geographically based Obviously, again, no pedagogical direction, no literary methodology. It's just that Imam Tabarani heard this hadith in Cairo. He heard this hadith in Jerusalem. He heard this hadith in Tus. He heard this hadith in Shiraz. He heard this hadith. And that's how the, the entire collection goes like this. This tradition would survive quite into the era of our own grandparents directly, Abdul Majid al Miknasi, rahimahullah, and, and others have compiled uh, Istinzalu um, al Sakinat al Rahmaniyya uh, with an Arba'in Buldaniyya that's modern in the 14th century of the Hijrah, which is only 100 years, o which is 100 years ago. Uh, al Hafiz al Mundiri published a 40 hadith collection based on Qadau Hawa'ij al Ikhwan, serving others. And here's another. Um, Again, another attempt at categorizing the 40 hadith collections in a way that was, um, that was somewhat topical. Uh, a very important 40 hadith collection, which is quite remarkable, compiled by Abu Qasim Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Birzali from the 7th century, uh, is called from the Sunan of Abu Abdullah ibn Majah. Uh, it's called al-Arba'un al-Tibbiyya. 
And from Kitab al-Tibb of Ibn Majah, Al-Birzali extracted 40 hadith in medicine. They were commented upon by uh, Abdul Latif ibn Yusuf ibn Abdul Rahman al-Baghdadi al-Muwaffaq. He's an eminent luminary from the 7th century. Uh, we have been honored to go through the entire commentary on the Arba'in al-Tibbiyah of al-Muwaffaq al-Baghdadi, uh, Abdul Latif rahimahullah. And it's quite interesting if you actually try to understand the, uh, the evolution of medical theory in the Islamic world beginning with the Prophet وسلم, evolving through um, germ theory uh, and totally transforming medicine uh, and, and medical knowledge way before um, anything like that uh, happened. Anybody here in med school or any physicians in the room? How old is germ theory in the Western world? When did we find out that we get diseases by viruses and microbes and flying things? How old is that? Maybe 200 years, 300 years? That's exactly. So the, um, the Prophet وسلم, introduced germ theory in his hadith warning people about hygiene. Now, this is very important as a parenthetical because it's urgent to understand the Prophet وسلم, speaking the language of the people in a way that they can relate and using even their myth and their superstition to empower them with new awareness. The Prophet وسلم, would refer to, would use the Arabic appellation of shaitan that refers to anything that is adha, that refers to anything that is odious or improper or repugnant, they would call it shaitan. And that was literally a, a classical appellation um, because in, the, in Quranic Arabic, the sh or the sheen, the t and the n have to do with distance from mercy or something alienating. Shatana uh, means to be far away as a verb, having nothing to do with Satan. But, so, but the attribution of the one who is accursed, the one who is condemned, the one that you want to be far away from, is a pre-Islamic notion, is a pre-Islamic denomination linguistically that the Prophet ﷺ used to the advantage of the Arabs by referring them to what was familiar to their language in order to elevate their medical awareness. So for example, when he وسلم, said, and you all taught your children this because we're all good Muslims and we want our children to be good Muslims, and you taught your children to cover their mouth when they yawn, lest what happens if they don't cover their mouth? Okay, three dots, you all know the rest. So, but the Prophet وسلم, was warning people about microbes and germs, not about some somebody or some creature from your left shoulder jumping into your um, esophagus or something. You know, it's, it's, it's totally unintelligible. And you have to remember that the Prophet وسلم, لا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirmed for him this, this quality.